My name is David Malone. I'm the rector of the UN University, which is headquartered in Tokyo, and we're coming to you from there today. Uh, we have with us a distinguished guest who's here from Stanford University, uh, Professor Stephen Stedman, uh, who this evening in Tokyo will be engaging a public audience on uh, the future of international order. So we wanted to bring you a bit of a sense of what we'll be discussing this evening uh, in the hope that if you come to Tokyo, you may join us one evening for a session like this. And in any event, that you'll get a sense of the sorts of issues that some of us in the UN University worry about, write about, do research about, and that uh, Professor Stedman does a lot of work on. So Steve, welcome, great to have you here. Thank you, Dave. And um, I think the, the sense that's growing of uh, a turbulent world uh, perhaps was initiated by events in Libya, then Syria, oh, in a slow moving way over the last five years or so. And um, these events have been accompanied by flows of uh, refugees out of both countries, both Libya and Syria. But those refugees often come from well beyond those uh, countries, Afghanistan, um, a variety of African countries as well. So I wanted to ask you where you think the, the current sense of uh, discomfort in the international community with the post-Cold War uh, order started. Mm -hmm. So I have to start by saying this is truly one of the, the great puzzles of our time. Because if you look back on the last 30 years, um, this has been a time of unparalleled prosperity in the world. More people have been brought out of poverty in the last 30 years than in all of history mm -hmm. before that. Um, if you take any indicator of human development, like food security or health, people are very much better off today, just talking globally, uh, than they were 30 years ago. Um, in terms of peace, uh, the world is a more peaceful place than it was 30 years ago. And yet, and yet, you have this incredible sense of anxiety and sense in the world of chaos, of a world spinning out of control. And it truly is a mystery to me how the reality of where we are can be so different from how it is described. Now, part of it could be that at any time in history, if you ask people, um, is there disorder in the world? They will say, yes, the world is in chaos, it's disorderly, and it will always seem disorderly, right? And there's always a sense of uh, sort of rosy retrospection, right? But in this case, uh, where so much prosperity and so much peace, and yet so much sense of disorder, you have to start probing. And I actually think that looking for events is the wrong place. Um, what you have to look at are much more fundamental processes that are going on over this time period about who is winning, who's losing from uh, globalization, uh, and also sort of the backlash against the globalizers. And uh, so that there was a backdrop, both uh, in Europe and in the United States, um, in part um, caused by the fact that the gains of globalization were uneven and the losers were, were concentrated in Europe and the United States. And here it's sort of working class. But also, um, you had the financial crisis of 2008, right? And a sense of those guys, meaning the elites, did this to us. And of course, the recovery 
is very spotty. There, there was a recovery, but it was spotty. But also, you know, it was a nice target as to who to blame. And so that's the backdrop for the events, right? Now, over those 30 years, immense amount of cooperation in the, in the world on economics, on finance, on trade, and on security. Although security is, is, is a bit uh, bifurcated, um, there was secure, the, the order depends on our alliances from the Cold War days. That hasn't changed. A lot of security in the world is, is built on the Cold War alliances that the United States had with NATO and with Japan and Korea. That remains. But even in security, there was a lot of cooperation on transnational threats, right? Um, so all of that is there. But the one area, if you look over the last 30 years, where there hasn't been order, it has been the Middle East. And it started right off the bat in 1990, right? Where it's the end of the Cold War, and what is the first challenge? The first challenge is Iraq invading Kuwait. And that just sends us off, because even after winning a very fast military victory, the peace in Iraq becomes this big uh, issue, troubling issue for collective security for the next 13 years until the United States decides unilaterally it's going to go in and invade without our allies. So it, this has been a constant actually over the 30 years. The one area of the world where you have not had stability, where you've had massive amount of disorder is this, is this area. Yes. Only we're just starting to notice it mm. and of course the effects are are finally being felt within Europe because of all of the, the, the refugees. Well, we'll come to the refugees in a second, so thanks for raising it. It's, a, it's an important angle linking up to uh, the current mood of, of populism and nationalism in a number of countries. But you touched on something I think that's very important and often neglected in security discussions, which is the fallout of the 2008 economic crisis, which seems to have disempowered many citizens in many countries or accelerated their disempowerment, leading to uh, them expressing themselves through electoral processes and other processes nowadays. So I wanted to ask you to come back to that for a second and give me your sense of that. Mm -hmm. So, again, a paradox that international cooperation in the aftermath of the financial crisis was actually quite good. And Dan Dresner, a political scientist in the States, has written a book, The System Worked, right? Um, the system of international cooperation on finance and on trade and on banking actually worked and it made sure that we did not go into a deep, deep depression. But the recovery has been slow, sluggish, um, and in some parts of Europe, in Greece and in Spain, of course, they essentially did go into depression. That's you know, really deep, deep losses. Um, but I think there was an immense amount of anger that was felt nationally within within political systems about what had happened, right? That, that did feed a politics of anger and resentment. Made worse by the fact that um, even though we didn't go into depression, the recovery has been very slow and sluggish. And of course, the, you know, the Europeans and the EU made a decision, really driven by Germany, that um, you know, austerity still made sense. Right? You are not going to prime the pumps to get dramatic growth back. Whereas the U.S. did prime the pumps to a certain degree. <laughs> to a certain degree, the, probably not enough, mm -hmm. um, but it helps to explain partially why the recovery was better in the United States than, than in Europe. But the politics have wound up being rather similar because the focus on inequality, disempowerment of a large part of the population, that's something the whole transatlantic region, or nearly all of it, has in common. 
And uh, the phenomenon of migration, uh, you point out rightly that this particular flow of migrants is not the greatest in history, that uh, mm -hmm. early in the 20th century there were greater flows in relative terms. Uh, but I think all these trends came together in a toxic brew, leading us to a sense of global instability mm -hmm. today. How would you describe its uh, principal features? The, the most worrisome one is, starts domestically, that um, you see the sense that international cooperation in security and in economics doesn't work. Um, and that the way to, to deal with this, is, uh, to deal with crisis, is to pull inwards, put up barricades, and return to self-help, right? That's what's going to get you through this difficult time. Internationally, it's, it's not straightforward. It's not straightforward because, you know, it's not that long ago, especially during in the heyday before you got to the crisis, that the great challenge for international order was going to be the rise of the BRICS and it was the rising powers and can we peacefully accommodate change, right? And can we count on China being a responsible stakeholder, right? That was all part of the mix, right? But there was always a sense well, if this machine keeps chugging along and economic growth through trade and, and, and movement of ideas and so forth, right, keeps up, well, of course you're going to buy them off and they'll be a responsible stakeholder, right? They're, they're, their regime depends upon it. And now, now after the crisis, I think there's some real doubts about um, how resilient globalization is, how resilient worldwide economic growth is. And what that's going to mean for political instability is, is really troubling. Um, you have Russia playing a very strange role in all of this, where at some point it decides under Putin it's going to become an anti-system player. You know, that it, that it can uh, annex the Crimea, that it can invade the Ukraine. Um, and this, this was unprecedented. This, was, this is a challenge to international order. This is not predictable. It is not the way th things are done. People don't annex territory anymore. And so, but I think the, the, the feeling was, well, they can always be managed, right? As long as everybody has a stake in keeping this global machine going, right? Keeping uh, the economy stoked, right? That's what uh, is going to keep everybody in it, and they're going to be isolated, and they're going to, you know, uh, be condemned to the rubbish heap of history because they're not going to play the game. And now, now everybody is realizing uh, this could be a lot stickier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Indeed. Well, listen, Steve, many thanks for doing this online. For those not joining us this evening, you'll get a sense from this what we'll be uh, discussing this evening. Obviously, global stability or instability and the economic and developmental factors underpinning that are central to the UN. And uh, Steve Stedman was the head of the staff of the high-level panel on uh, threats, challenges, and change eight years ago. It touched on some of these issues, but many of today's challenges were unforeseeable then. So coming back to it with you, Steve, uh, is terrific, and I'm looking forward to our discussion tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs>